right, let's uh, open our Bibles to John chapter 12, 12th chapter of the Gospel according to John. We're going to be picking it up tonight in verse 37, John 12, 37. Now remember, beginning in chapter 12, we have come now to the final week of the earthly ministry of Christ. Okay, just a few days from the cross now, and what we've studied the last couple of weeks were really Christ's final public words, his final public address to the nation of Israel. The scene is this. It's Passover week, okay? Everybody and their brother is in town for the holidays, and therefore, the Sanhedrin, the Jewish leadership, had planned on killing Jesus after the Passover. Their, their intent was to, to snuff him out under the radar, if you will. Now, Everybody has a sense that they wanted to kill Jesus. And of course, Jesus <laughs> knew that they wanted to kill Jesus. So, a good number of the Jewish leaders themselves did not think that Jesus would even show up. Is he going to show? Is he not going to show? I, I don't know. So let's get our thugs in the street, right? If he does show up, man, we want the intel out there immediately. We want to contain this thing. We want to spin this deal. Well, they didn't have to worry about their intel, did they? Because Christ openly marched publicly into Jerusalem and made no bones about it that he was there um, very publicly on his terms. Now, their disciples, though being blown away by what happened a couple of miles down the road and the raising of a decomposed body, you know, they're still looking over their shoulders, waiting for the authorities to kind of pop out of the brush. You know, and, and so Christ must have really surprised them when he said, boys, we're going to march right in there, okay? We're going to go, we're going to take the fight to them, we're going to head right to the mouth of the lion. And again, we need to recognize that, that Christ deliberately forced his agenda, okay? He was going to make sure that the laying down of his life and the taking up of his life was going to happen on his terms, not theirs. Remember, he said, no one's going to take my life until I'm good and ready, and I will take it up again when I choose to do so, John 10. Now, here's the deal. And of course, this took everybody by surprise, even our disciples. But no sooner did he march into the praises of Hosanna, save now the king is here, and the laying down of palm branches, no sooner did he do that than he began immediately speaking about his death. And God knew that, that these guys weren't going to get it, right? I mean, God was not surprised by their lack of understanding. The father was not up there, you know, um, scratching his head, pacing the corridors of the cosmos, saying, boy, you know, I, I, I really thought they'd get that whole dying to self gig, you know. I, maybe I better soften up the message a little bit and make them happy for a couple of days. You know, God did not do that. But that's what we do. Now, the program that Christ is laying out for these guys is the very same program that he's laying out for you and me today. By way of review last week, where we left off, if we want to serve Jesus, if we desire to call ourselves servants of Christ, that means we have to follow him right up that hill, right up there on that cross, right? That we must begin to lay aside our agenda and ask that, that his agenda would, would take its place and go forth in our lives. When we do that, we make the discovery that what? Being a part of God's bigger story, right? I mean, man, it's just so much richer and deeper than our own that as we allow God to rewrite the scripts in our lives, man, they are going to be so much more profound and, and so much more far-reaching than any script we could have, have written for our, our, our tiny little selves, right? That was where the Lord left us last week. Now, at the very tail end of the last verse we covered, look at verse 36 with me. We read, after speaking these things, Jesus left. He departed. He hid himself from them. Okay, you might have went away or, or whatever in your translation, but underline that at the end of verse 36 that he left. He departed. We'll get to that in a little bit. So Christ was done speaking publicly. The final address before the nation is over now. And as we talked about a moment ago, beginning next week for the next several chapters, he's going to hunker down with his disciples. He's going to be teaching 
and speaking specifically to them, his believers, his followers, okay? And, and man, that's going to be so good. We're going to have Bible study straight from the mouth of Jesus himself, right? Not speaking to the general public anymore, but he's focusing upon his own. That's you and me, yeah, believers, right? So it's going to be fantastic. Now, what we have for the remainder of chapter 12 then what we have before us, picking it up in verse 37, are really two things. Okay, a summation, if you will, of two things. First of all, John is going to highlight the Jews' response to the three-year ministry of Jesus Christ. That's from verses 37 to 43. And then following that, from verse 44 through 50, John is going to give us then a thumbnail sketch, a, a summation really, of the thrust of what Christ had taught during his three-year ministry. So, we're very near the end, two or three days from the crucifixion of Christ. Christ has now spoken his final words to the nation, and John is now going to tell us how the people have responded. Now, the fascinating thing to me that's always been a mystery is, is just how and when an individual comes to the faith. That whole concept is just wrapped in, in such great mystery. Some of you remember our study of Joshua, uh, Joshua. Here you had Rahab, a prostitute, one of just a multitude of people in this city about to fall. And, and why was it that, that just she, of all those people, you know, came to, came to a, a, a positive understanding of the Lord, responded positively to the Lord. And maybe you look at your own family situation and you see yourself as being maybe just one of a handful of people. You know, why me? Why not my brothers? Why not my sister? Did you ever wonder about that? Okay. Now, we have to remember that Christ said what? That the way to salvation would be a narrow road. And there would be few that would be upon it. But that the path to destruction was a very wide, wide road. And that there would be many upon it. And so how and why certain people respond? Well, I guess Jesus gives us the odds to a certain degree, right? But man, still, how that works is a real mystery to us. I think the word for us tonight has some real insight for us here. Okay? And so much more. In fact, we're going to tackle some areas tonight that have given the body of Christ a number of fits over the years. So, here is Christ. He's given his word to the people, and now we're going to see how they responded. How then did the Jews respond to this three-year ministry of Christ? Let's notice then, digging in then tonight and picking it up in verse 37. And Tony Joe, let's go with just 37. But though he had performed so many signs before them, yet they were not believing in him. Let's under so many signs and not believing. Well, again, one of the things that I love about studying the Bible verse by verse is, is not only are you going to get the full counsel of God, but you're going to come upon the issues with the frequency that God would have you to come upon the issues, right? Right? Here it is yet again. The only thing that a signs and wonders faith produces is an appetite for yet more signs and wonders. Bible students, if you really want to get a hold of this idea, I would suggest in the quietness of your hearts this week, studying Psalm 78. Very long psalm. There's a summation of all that God had done for Israel, moves right on down the line through all the things that he did for them, and they still hardened their hearts against him. They still complained. They still murmured. Psalm 78 is really a case study in how a signs and wonders faith produces nothing. Okay? I'm not sure what more these people could have seen, I mean, over the course of the three-year ministry of Christ, right? They saw walking on the water. They saw the multitudes, thousands fed twice. They saw water turned into wine. They saw a blind guy healed, a lame man healed. I mean, it, it, and it climaxed with a raising of a, the, the third guy he raised from the dead. But this time, it climaxed with the raising of a decomposed body from the dead. Here is a group of people who for three years were watching, witnessing, the miraculous power of God through Jesus of Nazareth. And, and yet, man, it was like, 
BBs off a battleship, right? I mean, there was no penetration whatsoever. This is why the Apostle Paul said, look, we're to walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. That's why Jesus himself said, it is a perverse generation that seeks after a sign. Now, does that then somehow mean that signs and wonders are bad? Well, that depends on the source, okay? I think this is a real area of difficulty for the church, for the body of Christ today. I think there is a galactic lack of understanding here, and so I want to get this deal in the light of God's word, okay? The Apostle Paul tells us that in the last days, the devil will be here with his lying signs and wonders. 2 Thessalonians 2.9, okay? Jesus himself, Christ himself, cautioned believers. He said, look, you guys need to understand something. Matthew 24, 24, it's your memory verse on your study guide. He said, look, you need to understand something. False false Christs and false prophets, false teachers will come with signs and wonders to deceive even the elect. The elect believers, you and me. Well, then how do I know? I mean, how am I supposed to discern this? Well, the word of God, of course, right? Psalm 119, 105, that word is a lamp under your feet, a light under your path. Here's the score on signs and wonders. I want you to have clarity. I want you to have discernment here because I know this can be a very difficult area to navigate, all right? Listen, there is nothing wrong with signs and wonders until you begin to seek after them. Let me say that again. There is nothing wrong with signs and wonders until you begin seeking after them. Again, Christ said, don't seek after them. Now, once we begin to elevate them or pursue them, we're putting ourselves in harm's way of deception. All right? Once you begin to elevate the pursuit of signs and wonders, you are putting yourselves in harm's way of deception for what Paul and, and, and Christ spoke about. Now, the Bible says that, that signs and wonders follow believers. Absolutely. Mark 16, 20. No doubt about it. But don't get that backwards. Believers are not to follow signs and wonders. Signs and wonders are to follow after believers. As you pursue Christ, as you follow him, as you are, visa last week, right? As you are dying to your own agendas, believe me, miracles are going to happen, all right? And I think you're okay there. If a sign or wonder points to the person and works of Jesus Christ, then I think you're okay there. God is still very much in the business of healing today, all right? God is still in the business of bringing forth the miraculous when he sees fit to do so. But if we are beginning to pursue signs and wonders rather than just seeking to die to ourselves and follow Christ, then I think you've got a real problem. If you begin to elevate the pursuit of miracles over the person of Christ, then I think you've got a real problem and I think the devil will be happy to step in and deceive you and wow you as long as he can keep your eyes off Christ. If the sign and wonder elevates a man or a ministry, I think you've got a real problem, all right? If a man or ministry tells you they can teach you how to heal or how to manifest or walk in signs and wonders, I think El Diablo has stepped in and deceived, and I think you've got a real problem. And I think it's all around us today. We should not be surprised by that. Jesus told us flat out, again, these false teachers are going to come and deceive the elect. Guys, the good news is, I think the deal is pretty simple as you simply bring the full counsel of God to bear upon it. Don't pursue signs and wonders. Don't elevate these kinds of miraculous experiences over a simple daily walk with the Lord himself, and you're going to be okay. All right? Just continue to pick up your cross and die to your own agenda and follow Christ, and you will be kept safe from deception. 
just as Paul said, walk by faith, not by sight. Now, when you have a friend or a loved one that needs supernatural help or healing, you absolutely pray for that person, okay? And you trust that the Lord's decision there is done with the totality of eternity in view, okay? That's not chasing signs and wonders. That's obedience, right? Paul tells the Philippians, don't be anxious about it, anything, but in prayer and thanksgiving, let your requests be made, made known to God. But when you begin to pursue signs and wonders for the sake of experience, when your primary goal is no longer simple obedience to the Lord, when you become a signs and wonders chaser, man, you are swinging the door wide open for deception that the majority of the church is not even aware exists. Okay? And that's why we have so much junk deceiving people out there today. Just simply follow Jesus, and you're going to have more wonder than you can handle with a dump truck. Okay? All right. Now, does that make sense to you? Okay. Now, I think we've got another issue here as well. Again, here's a group of people in verse 37 here that is showing you and I the fruit of walking by sight. Again, what more could they have seen? They still did not believe. Faith does not come by miracles. Now, oftentimes we'll think, won't we? Well, you know, if this unsaved friend of mine could just see a miracle, if I could just take him to a tent meeting and they could see a leg lengthening or something, you know, I'm sure they would come. No, <laughs> all right? The word very clear, clearly tells us what? Faith does not come by miracles, but Romans 10, 17 Faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. Amen. All right. Now, again, did the unbelief of Israel catch God by surprise? Was God sitting there on the throne thinking, gee whiz, you know, I thought the Lazarus deal would really bring him around. Now what am I going to do? <laughs> did God not see this coming? Q verse 38. This was to fulfill the word of Isaiah the prophet, which he spoke. Lord, who has believed our report, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? All right, well, this is from one of my favorite uh, chapters, and uh, one of the best-known chapters in the Old Testament, Isaiah 53, where it is prophesied that the Messiah, uh, the Messiah would be what? Despised and rejected by men, a, a man of sorrows, the iniquities would of us would be laid upon him, right? Isaiah was talking about how the Messiah would be the suffering servant of God. Well, Isaiah, as he has this vision, begins his prophecy by saying, who in the world is going to believe this deal? Who in the world would believe that the, the immutable, omniscient, all-powerful God would wrap himself in a skin suit and give his life for the likes of you and I. Verse 38 here is a direct quote from Isaiah 53, 1. So, Isaiah was prophesying, well, this is what God's going to do, but I don't think very many people are going to believe it. Now, not to get all metaphysical on you, but time and space to God, time and space to God are simply vehicles through which he relates to his creation. God in his sovereignty is, is outside of time altogether, right? And he's somehow able to look down the tunnel of time and know who is going to respond to him and who is not going to respond to him. If we could just get that, we wouldn't have all these arguments about predestination and election. God is outside of time, and he is able to look down the tunnel of time somehow and know who's going to respond, who's going to not. So God understood God recognized before Christ was even placed in Mary's womb, for crying out loud, that not many people are going to believe this deal. Now, the problem with unbelief, the very dangerous and very tricky part of unbelief, is what we now have before us in verses 39 to 41. Let's read those. For this reason they could not believe, for Isaiah said again, He has blinded their eyes, and he hardened their heart so that they would not see with their eyes and perceive him with their heart and be converted, and I heal them. These things Isaiah said because he saw his glory and he spoke of him. Oh, man, this is so rich. All right. 
Let's back up, verse 39. Underline, could not. Could not believe. That's pretty interesting, right? Could not. Mark it very carefully. It doesn't say they would not believe. It says there in verse 39, they could not believe. If it said they would not believe, that would indicate they had a choice in the matter, would it not? It appears to indicate that at some point, they no longer had a choice in the matter. If you said, well, I won't do that. Well, that's an indication for whatever reason you choose not to do that. But if you say, I can't do that, then that means somehow that you don't have the ability to do whatever it is that we're asking you to do. Verse 39 says they could not believe. At some point in time, there seems to be, listen, this idea within the scriptures that there is a line that can be crossed. Whoa. The writer of Hebrews gives us those very, Bible students, you know this. The writer of Hebrews gives us those very ominous verses in chapter 10, right? Hebrews 10, 25, 26. These have messed with me for years. What do you do with this? I don't know. Hebrews 10, 25, and 26. I'll read it for you. You can look at it later. If we go on sinning deliberately after receiving the truth, then there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins but a fearful expectation of judgment. Hebrews 10, 25, 26. If we go on sinning deliberately after the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for our sins, but the fearful expectation of judgment. Now, I don't know what you do with that, but it certainly appears that there is a line in the sand that can be crossed where the ability to turn and repent is no longer there. The Apostle Paul indicates to Timothy the idea that repeated sin can sear the conscience. First Timothy 4.2, right? Repeated sin can sear the conscience. This is a very difficult idea we're being presented with here, guys. Now, do we find anything consistent with this in the rest of Scripture? Yeah, I think we do. We have the story of Moses and Pharaoh. You know it well. We studied it together. In the beginning, it was Pharaoh hardening his own heart, right? Moses came to Pharaoh and said, oh, come on, man. Let's make it easy on me. Let's make it easy on you. Just let the people go, would you? And we read that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And that continued. Another plague comes and goes, and this went on and on. Moses would come to Pharaoh and say, look, man, I tried to tell you, would you let my people go already? And again, we read that Pharaoh hardened his heart. But as you continue in the narrative, you then begin to read, and God hardened his heart. Now, when God hardens the heart of an individual, what he is doing is simply turning them over to that which they want. All right? This is what you want. This is what you want your life to become. I mean, this is how you wish to live, then fine, and God turns them over to that. We see that three times in Romans chapter 1 alone. Anybody remember Noah? Yeah. Genesis 6, God said, my spirit will not always strive with man. Genesis 6, 3. Here's Noah. For many years, he's building this big ocean liner, this big barge in his driveway, right? I mean, there's no miles, there's no water for miles and miles around. One day, God finally says, Noah, get in the boat, I've had it. This is it, get in the boat. He then goes and he gets in the boat. Now, Noah does, Noah does not stand there, he does not stand there at the entrance to the boat and say, all right, I've had it with you people, you're going to burn in hell and I hope you're going to be happy, and then slams the door. He does not do that. Noah gets in the boat and God shuts the door. Genesis seven sixteen. God shuts the door. It was the Lord that said, all right, now it's going to be impossible for you to turn, impossible for you to repent, I'm going to shut the door. The deal is this, guys. God will never violate the free will of a person. 
He will never jeopardize the integrity of choice because flat out, without the exercise of choice, you cannot have love. You can have coercion, you can have robots, but you can't have love. Is this a difficult idea? Yes. Does God, being holy and perfect, have to respect the integrity of choice? Yes. He gave us free will. We talked two weeks about, uh, ago about how dangerous of a gift that was. God does not want a robotic relationship with his creation. He does not want coercion. He will never force a person to believe in him. If you choose not to believe, he has to honor that choice. All right? Putting it all together, the Bible tells us repeated sin will sear a person's conscience, that God will not always strive with man, And the writer of Hebrews tells us there is a line, I don't know where. And there is a time, I don't know when. But in a person's case, they cross it. It can become an impossibility for them to ever turn, for them to ever be saved. Now, all that to say this, really tune in. Here is the very sobering danger of unbelief. This is the problem with unbelief. Listen up. The longer one stays on the path of unbelief, the more confirmed you become in your belief system. Okay? The longer one remains in sin and unbelief, the deeper the conscience becomes seared, becomes burned, and that conscience can become so seared, so burned, that essentially there's nothing left. There's nothing even there to cause a person to desire to turn. All right? So the problem with unbelief is that the longer you stay upon that path, the more increasingly difficult it becomes for a person to turn. I read a Barna study this week that suggested that 64% of those that make a decision for Christ do so before their 18th birthday. Less than 23% embraced Christ after their 21st birthday. Now, it could be that a lot of the focus of evangelism within the church is towards those who are younger. But I think it also speaks very clearly to this fact that the longer you stay on the path of unbelief, the more difficult it is to get off. Whatever path you're on today, I I don't know what path you're on, right? I mean, I can guess what path most of you are on because you're here. But whatever path, you know, if you're on the path of faith, awesome. Maybe you're on the path of unbelief. Whatever path you're on, point is the longer you're on that path, the more solidified you become upon that path. Therefore, when you hear the gospel, if you're on the path of faith, it's like, oh man, glory. God loves me and he's, he's so gracious and he's so merciful. And man, I just, I love the gospel of God. And it pushes you further down that path. On the other hand, If you're on the path of unbelief, it's, well, Jesus schmeezes, right? I mean, get away from me with that. I I don't want nothing to do with that stuff. And that pushes you further down the road to unbelief. And again, that problem is compounded by the idea that there's a line in the sand that the scriptures appear to, to paint where it can become very difficult, if not impossible, for them to ever turn for them to ever be saved. And this is why I believe, friends, that we need to have a greater sense of urgency. A greater sense of urgency in being about what it is that God has called us to be about. And what has he called us to be about? Sharing the gospel. Now, here in John chapter 12, God has the nation of Israel. For three years, he put up with their hard-heartedness. For three years, he has revealed the glory of his son to them just over and over and over again. And now they have crossed that line where repentance and turning, turning to salvation is now out of the question. They have crossed that line and we now read, they could not believe. All right. And again, this was prophesied by Isaiah as well, right? The Lord's not taken by surprise here. In verse 40, we have the second quote from Isaiah. Now this one's from Isaiah 6.10. Verse 41, if you ever have Jehovah's Witnesses knocking on your door from time to time, you want to pay special attention to verse 41, okay? The J-dubs, as I call them, with great affection, 
The J-dubs, like any cult really, they deny the deity of Jesus Christ. Paul would say in Galatians, they, they subscribe to another gospel, okay? They don't believe in the Jesus you and I believe in. They deny the deity of Christ. Jehovah's God, but Jesus is not God. Now, it says here in verse 41, and man, this is great for you and I as well. I, I mean, you know, it says here in verse 41 that Isaiah saw the glory of God. When, he, I, when Isaiah saw the glory of God, whose glory was he seeing? Well, John is asserting here he was seeing the glory of Jesus Christ. When Isaiah was talking about the Lord and his prophecies, who was he talking about? He was talking about Jesus Christ. This is an amazing verse. Now, a J-dubs, Jehovah's Witness, will have no trouble agreeing with you that in Isaiah 6, you know, when Isaiah says, well, I saw the Lord high and lifted up and his glory filled the temple and, and the angelic realm was saying, holy, holy, you know, that, and so forth. They'll have no trouble agreeing with you that Isaiah is talking about Jehovah. Now here in verse 41, John is specifically saying that when, when Isaiah saw the glory of God, he was speaking of, describing, seeing Jesus Christ. The Jehovah of Isaiah is Jesus Christ. Again, the whole book was written of him. All right? So if you have those guys knocking on your door from time to time, you might want to tuck that one away. All right. Well, let's pick it up in verse 42 then and look at verse 42 and 43. Nevertheless, many even... What? Never... <laughs> that didn't sound right. Nevertheless, many even of the rulers believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they were not confessing him for fear that they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved the approval of men rather than the approval of God. All right. Now it is interesting that evidently the Apostle John had some kind of a connection to the high priest. We don't know what it was. Maybe it was a family thing. Maybe it was a business thing. Maybe they were childhood friends. We don't know, okay? But what we do know is that John had some kind of a relationship with the high priest. That's why when they arrest Christ in John 18, they take him behind closed doors for interrogation, and we're told that John comes to the door that's barred to the general public, and they let John in. They don't let Peter in, but they let John in. And the reason he's allowed to go in is because he had a relationship with the high priest. That's why all through the Gospel of John thus far, John is able to tell us, well, you know, they had this meeting over here, and, and this guy over here said this, and this guy said that. How does John know these things? John knows because he's well-connected. And because John is well-connected, he knows, verse 42, that there are a group of these Jewish leaders who are sympathetic towards the cause of Christ. They believe he is the genuine article. But the reason they won't man up and step to the plate is because they don't want to lose their jobs, right? They don't want to get kicked out of the synagogue. We saw that back in chapter 9. Now, here's where it gets interesting. There is a very good reason to suspect that a secret faith here is not a saving faith. All right? A secret faith is not a saving faith. We're told they believed he was the genuine article, but we're told here as well, the Holy Spirit goes out of his way to point out here as well, that they did not confess him. Underline that word confess. You might have openly acknowledge. You might have admit in your translation. Underline that. They did not confess him. Listen. Jesus said, whoever confesses me before men, I will confess before the angels of God. But whoever denies me before men, so also will I deny them. Luke 12, verses 8 and 9. Which I'm pretty sure is why the Apostle Paul says, and what has become a very popular evangelical verse, Romans 10, 9, if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So, for a faith that does not confess Christ we have very good reason to suspect that maybe there's not really a saving faith there at all. So if we have any secret believers out there, you might want to make a very sobering mental note here. Now, verse 43 really puts the whole deal in perspective, okay? 
They wanted to push their thoughts concerning Christ under the radar because we read their desire to please men was greater than their desire to please God. What really jumped out at me as I studied this, and this is what, well, we'll talk about this in a second. What really jumped out at me as I studied this was the word for loved there in verse 43. Uh, Underline that. It says they loved the praise of men. Okay? That word for love there is agape. All right? A number of you know that that's the very strongest and highest form of love rendered by the Greek language. These guys agaped the praise of men. They absolutely worshipped and loved the praise of men. That ought to be clue number two, by the way, that there was not a saving faith here. Now, one of the most foolish things that you can do in the ordering of your life is to try and become a people pleaser. Okay? If you try to live your life keeping everybody happy, saying and doing those things that are going to please everyone around you, you are going to become discouraged and you are going to become disenfranchised with life. Why? Two reasons at least. Number one, because the praise and the glory of men is so short-lived. All right? We live in a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately culture. That's the chief reason why professional athletes struggle so frequently with depression. I mean, I don't care. I mean, look at Facebook. Oh, go Tigers, go Tigers, go Tigers. What do you read now? Well, this guy bleep and that guy that and this, you know, and, and it's just, you know, it doesn't matter how well you perform all year or how talented you are, man, if you blow, if you're a player that blows a game in the finals, man, you do not want to be on the social networking sites the next day, do you? Right? The armchair athletes will rip you to shreds. What have you done for me lately? The praise and glory of men is so short-lived. That's the first reason it makes no sense to please men, but rather to please God. Number two, if you try and please the guy on your right, the very thing that you do to please that guy on the right is the very thing that's going to torque off the guy on your left. Are we not seeing that play out before us on the presidential election stage? Right? Right? I mean, we are being led by men and women for the most part that that just don't want to come out and say, this is right, this is wrong. What our candidates have done for decades, I'm not picking on anybody now, but, but what our candidates have done for decades is they've hired very skilled writers to spin positions in such a way that will be the least likely to offend the greatest number of people. And that's why election after election, it's a very rare thing for somebody to deliver upon their campaign promises. We are being led by people pleasers, all right? Now, where this affects the church is this, and I can hardly believe this is going to come out of my mouth. Where this affects the church is this, most of us just don't share the gospel, I looked at as many studies as I could, man, and and the results were all over the map, from 2% to 42%. So I'm not really sure where the math is. But conservatively even, the fact that 60% of believers have never shared their faith even once with an unbeliever is unthinkable to me. Because I think the, the fear of pleasing men In the fear of keeping people happy, because of that, the majority of Americans flat out don't share the gospel. Now, I understand that, well, you know, we got to develop a relationship with them, and we've got to become friends. I understand all of that, but I believe we can use that as a crutch as well. Okay? And here's the scary part. The longer you're supposedly investing in the relationship, what's happening? They're spending more time on that path of unbelief, right? And they are becoming more entrenched in that unbelief. Now, again, I I think building relationships is very wise. No doubt it's a very discerning thing to do. But let us recognize that that can become a crutch as well, that the enemy in your flesh are going to get in there with that. What you need to ask yourself in the quietness of your hearts this week, and it is a very, 
very serious question with eternal uh, ramifications. What you need to ask yourself this week is, am I fearing them, Lord? A am, I, am I fearing that I'm going to upset them? Am I afraid they're going to think I'm weird or goofy? Or, Lord, am I really trying to build a relationship here in order that I might then have some real authority to speak truth into their lives? You got to figure that one out. Okay? You got to figure that one out. All right. Well, let's set up this last passage of verses tonight. Again, I want you to, to go back to, I want you to notice at the end of verse 36, I had you underline that. Noticed it said back up there that Christ departed, he's left the scene. We're told he hid himself from them. That was the end of Jesus' public address to the nation of Israel. He's now off the scene, and the next time we hear from Jesus will be with the disciples uh, behind closed doors. Now, what John is doing for the remainder of the chapter, remember, he's given us a summary now of Israel's response to the three-year ministry of Christ. What John is doing for the remainder of the chapter is he is now turning and giving us a thumbnail sketch of the main thrust of what Jesus taught during his three years in public ministry. You might call this last section of verses John's compilation, John's mixtape of Jesus' greatest hits, if you will. Okay, So we've got the best of Jesus on one CD here. John concludes his rendering of the public ministry of Christ with a summary of his core teaching. So finally tonight then, let's close. Uh, Tony Joe, let's go all the way home, verse 44 through 50. And Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my sayings and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him in that last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. I know that his commandment is eternal life, therefore the things I speak... I speak just as the Father has told me. Sound familiar? It ought to, after studying uh, John's gospel. All right, let's go right back up to the top of verse 44. I want to make sure you get this. Not a huge deal, but the first word in the English translation, you might have and or then or again. Uh, the first word in our English translations is a Greek particle that we usually translate as but. Okay, the interesting thing is most of the time when we see this particle in the original language, we just leave it out. We don't translate that at all as in the English. We leave it out. Why some translations include it, not sure. I, I suppose they did it for the flow. But the idea in the original uh, manuscripts here, pretty straightforward. The idea is that John has just given a summary of Israel's reaction, but here's what Jesus had to say, kind of a deal. And the Greek verbs that follow that particle indicate to you and I that these are things that Jesus was, was saying repeatedly, all right? Now, let's turn our attention to what has been said here in a larger sense. Let's back off the trees. Let's look at the forest because, again, much of what's been said here uh, we've devoted quite a bit of time to earlier in our study of John's gospel. For example, you know, verses 44 and 45, um, you know, we, we cover that in John chapter 5. When he talks about, in verse 46, being a light to the world, that's John 8, 12, and, and on and on. John 47, from John 3, or verse 47, from John 3, 17, and so forth. So I want to back off here a bit and look at what Jesus is saying in a larger sense, because I think that we can just sort of read through the, the red letters without giving a, a whole lot of thinking to, to, position, to the position that the man that is speaking is taking. Think for a minute, all right? Think with me now, okay? What has Jesus just said? He has just said to other human beings that if you believe in me, it's just like believing in God. Do you hear me? Well, that's hearing God. Now, if a guy comes up to you on the street, right, and tries to strike up a conversation with you, and the guy says, you know, yeah, you know, uh, believing in me is <laughs> pretty much like believing in God. 
And you know, it, you know, it, hearing me is, is pretty much like hearing God. I mean, it's time to go, right? I mean, you're going you're gonna to begin to try and check out of that conversation as soon as you possibly can. And then you're going to go home and you're going to tell your spouse, you're not going to believe the whack job I just ran into at Walmart, right? Now, when we look at what Christ is saying to you, understand, gosh, we become so dull of herring, as the writer of Hebrews would say. Understand how radical he is. Understand that time and time again, Christ is forcing us to make a judgment on who he is. He is either the living God manifested in the flesh or a complete lunatic. He does not leave us any middle ground. Do we get that? He is either God, in which case, man, I better wake up, or he is the biggest nut that has ever graced the planet. If you have not made this decision firm and clear in your mind, today is a great day to do that. Okay? You know who I'm talking to. All it takes is that mustard seed of faith, and God's going to take it from there. Please, I beg of you, come and see me afterwards. Let's pray together, and you can confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord with that, that mustard seed of faith, and man, you can be ushered into his eternal glory, world without end. Now, what he says in verses 40 and, uh, 47 and 48, again, part, part of this we covered in John 1 and John 3, but I want to leave you with this here. Uh, Christ is, what I want you to see is Christ is saying that you and I are holding in our hands his words, his heart, okay? That he is the word. You remember from John chapter 1, right? This whole deal started, right? In the beginning was the word, and the word came and lived among us, right? Wrapped himself in flesh and dwelt among us. The idea here is that it, are, is, that it, is, it is his words that judge us. His words that impart life, that he himself is the spoken word of God, right? God is a spirit, John 4, 24, right? And so he wrapped himself in flesh and he became that spoken word in his son. Again, some people speak in French. Some people speak in Spanish. Some people speak in English. We do. But our heavenly Father speaks in Christ. Okay? Jesus is the language that our heavenly Father speaks in. He is the spoken word of our heavenly Father. And his word is in your hands, dying to make its way into your heart, literally and figuratively. Okay? Jesus said, the volume of the book is written of me. Do you want to know Jesus? Here he is. Here is his heart right here. These are his words, and that's why the writer of Hebrews says his word is alive and active and living, right? As we close out tonight, friends, my overarching desire for you is that you will become enamored with in awe of this great God we serve. Man, the fountainhead from everything from which your Christian lives will flow Everything that your, your walk with the Lord will flow from is your awe of him. If you prayed nothing this week other than, God, give me awe, you would be well to do, all right? My dream for you, my whole reason to be here is to get you to get in his word throughout the week and, and just long to get to know him. The volume of the book is written of him. John has told us tonight that Isaiah was speaking all about Jesus Christ. You go back to Isaiah chapter 6. There's Isaiah saying, I saw the Lord high and lifted up. His glory filled the temple. And the angelic realm was crying, holy, holy, holy. Right? When Isaiah was seeing that, who was Isaiah seeing? Isaiah was seeing Jesus Christ. Here is this great God. Here is this great God over all of the angelic realm, filling the heavenly temple with his glory. 
And yet this great God, do, do we understand what he's done? This great God, the architect of life, the designer of DNA, who's given you this body, right? I mean, this body that David said is fearfully and wonderfully made, right? This God has taken an electric pump and he's put it in your chest, all right? And it pumps 2,000 gallons of blood a day. That's nine tons of fluid that goes through this electric pump every day. It beats 100,000 times a day. If you're 50 years old, it's pumped 1,825,000,000 times. It is connected to over 60,000 miles of blood vessels. And this God who created it all, this God who designed it all, this God that Isaiah was saying filled the temple with his glory, decided that he was going to wrap himself in flesh and dwell among us, even though he knew the majority of us would reject him. This great God, our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, came knowing that the vast majority of humanity would want nothing to do with him or his story. And yet he does it. Why does he do it? He he did it all because of you. He did it all because of you. The joy of being able to look at you and look at me and say, look, I've... I've chosen you. I picked you to be mine. I've known you while you were being formed in your mother's womb and before. And I've picked you and I love you. And I have given everything I got for you because of my great love for you. I have done it all for you. And friends, we have to remember that this great God, this creator, this architect, is not some theological deity. He is a person that thinks and weeps and feels and grieves and experiences joy just like you and I do as a person. He is a person. Relate with him this week as a person. Pursue him as a person. He is meant to be experienced at this conscious level. God has built you and created you to relate with his son and indeed himself through this conscious level every day. Not below, not above, nothing highfalutin and lofty. God has built you to relate with him as a person. He did it all because of you. Approach his person this week. When you pray to him, pray to that person. He is so real, so real. Open your hearts. Open your hearts this week, friends. Be in awe of this person that has done so much for you and has so much for you as you give yourself to him. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you. Lord, that your glory even fills our hearts now. May your your glory and the reality of your person just fill our hearts, expand our hearts, turn us upside down, undo us that we might see your person, that we might love upon you and live for you and cry out to you because you became a person in your son. God, give us a holy hunger. Fill us, Lord, with that hunger, Lord. Fill us that we would hunger for, for, and thirst for righteousness in order that we might be filled. Fill us this week, God. Give us an awe, a new awe of your son as we head into these Bible studies now where your son is going to speak directly to our hearts. I pray that you would prepare our hearts for just this intimate encounter with you that we've got coming up. And, and God, I pray that, that you would move upon hearts to, to invite people to come and experience the reality of the person of your son with us. God, we love you this week. We ask these things 
in the name of our precious Savior, Jesus Christ. And we said, amen.